Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you for all the sharing, everyone. And uh, looks like everyone is able to share more and more. Uh, and uh, when you can share more and more, I can take a break. Yay. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I've been sharing nonstop. And uh, two sermons a week. And before that was three sermons and sometimes more when you have a leadership meeting. Uh, have not repeated myself, uh, always enhance upon it. And because uh, I make it look easy, uh, but I can tell you that anything that you do in the Lord is not easy. And it's a mistake if people think that planting a church or growing a ministry, uh, it's just, uh, you know, open a place and people will come. Uh, come on. When someone opens a restaurant, they, uh, they open a shop, and uh, if they're successful, you say, ah, that's it. No, you don't know what's going on behind. Uh, specialization of the menu, uh, learning ways to pray in which you, you, you visualize and get people to come, uh, part of like Choyung Gi principles. And uh, then your food must be good. Your customer service must be good. Put it this way. Anything successful in this life, if it was easy, everyone in the world would have succeeded. No doubt some people get it slightly easier than others and more advantage than others. But if you don't have this philosophy and understanding, which is from the Bible, I sometimes call it philosophy, but it's from the Bible, that in the Bible, everyone who succeeds has to be given some acknowledgement because there's hard work, there are principles, and there are things that they do understand that make them succeed. Which is why even for non-Christian, when they succeed, we have probably some things to learn from them. Jesus says sometimes the people of this world are wiser than the people of the kingdom of God. When it comes to worldly things, there's always things they can learn from everyone. In this uh, topic that we are going to flow through, and uh, there is a certain discipline that one needs in order to continue to have downloads from God. Uh, in this year, I've given myself more to the Lord, uh, following the Lord. I say, Lord, this year, uh, the angel wants to come as his prophesy. And I like to prepare myself to fulfill the prophecy. And uh, over the last week, as uh, I was spending that two extra hours, I do meditating, waiting upon the Lord. Then suddenly, uh, uh, there was this angel appear on my left. And that is the one on my right, whom I know. And uh, said, hey, this is new. And I could feel the warm sensation. And, 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 and the angel says uh, he has come in fulfillment of the prophecy. So everything, everything has a cost, a price to pay. We are on a study on relationships, biblical relationships. And um, I like uh, us to look at the chart again before I move on. Because uh, we're going to conclude on the chart that I gave the last week. And so that we can gain and learn and understand from uh, uh, biblical relationships. And I would agree with a lot of the sharing that's been going on. The most important thing is not to judge. Not to judge. But to understand that each one functions according to their revelation. Each one functions according to what the Lord has asked them to do, and each one functions according to the development and personality. Uh, we're getting the chart. As Colin is getting the chart, let's turn to Acts 15. Okay, this is a chart that we saw last week. There are a lot of things in this chart, and... Uh, you can see that deep inside is all the fruit of the Spirit. The undercurrent is the fruit of the Spirit. By this time in the Lord, I don't think we can accuse anyone of doing something in the flesh. We should know better. And uh, in this late hour, 
in the end time, uh, it is important to know that we have to be moved by the Spirit and do things by the Spirit. In fact, to say that you know, somebody is in the flesh, somebody is not, is judging itself. And um, so uh, it's not fair. The only judge is Jesus. What Jesus wants to do, and each person hears from the Lord differently. And um, then as you look in this example, some people, although we're all supposed to develop into all these five dimensions, we have to develop one at a time. And sometimes God pair people, lion with lion, or lion with calf, or calf with calf, or eagle with uh, man. And uh, the central thing that holds everyone together is Jesus, the Lamb of God. And uh, that is with meekness. And um, so there's a difference between being persistent and being rude. And uh, as far as uh, all the things that have been uh, discussed and taught, no rudeness is there. But persistence and a certain way of style of doing things is a different thing from being rude. And um, being rude is when you pick up the phone and you're shouting at a person. You, you're not talking. And uh, so it can be easily proven in all situations that there is a talk going on. And there's a reason where I believe over this week that we're handling a, a problem or last week. And I say, look, I respect your view, but you must respect my view. Uh, so it's still talking. It, no one is shouting at each other. That would be getting into the flesh. And so it's important uh, as we deal with each issue is to respect how each person deal with each issue and don't jump the gun and say, hey, you know, we, we are different. Different means you're wrong and I'm right. Uh, I'm right, you're wrong. No, no, no one is saying that. It's just important sometimes. Uh, for example, if, if a person attack me, I will defend. I say, look, my perspective is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then in the process of defending, if you disagree, you will sound like you're under attack. Okay, I think the pastor's uh, video feed has uh, frozen. So, uh... We will get back uh, pretty soon. Uh, it could be an internet issue. So everyone, again, um, Pastor is getting back on the uh, internet. I think there is a connection problem. Okay, I think Pastor is joining back now. Pastor has joined back already, so uh, just hang on. Yay, we're up again. All right. So all the sharing each one year been done is good. And I like Abraham sharing on where he say that uh, when we judge, each one has their own little circle. And uh, it's important not to judge another person's circle and to just uh, accept each other, which is where, as we look at all the differences, which today we're going to study couples and how they relate to each other. But I'm so good, also going to point to probably the next week how different men of God have to work together differently. The key in couples as well as in people relating to each other or family members is unity in diversity. It's not just unity in monotony. That means 
The unity is not produced by everyone becoming a lion or everyone becoming an eagle or everyone claiming to be the lamb. And uh, unity cannot be achieved as long as you point a finger at another person. There are three fingers pointing back at you. And uh, unity can be only achieved when you accept the other person's opinion and the op other person's function and the other person's action without judging them. And so that's the key. So let me give a, a case study and then I go to the couples. Now remember this chart, there are all the dynamics of the energy spiritually flowing in each person. And uh, we have to take that at this time in the end time, everyone is seeking to hear from the Lord. Everyone is seeking to obey the Lord. And everyone deals with issues according to the way the Lord shows. At the end, the Lord is the judge. And like all things in life, results are important. Results are important. And um, uh, results are important. And I want to share something that I shared long ago. Remember how I say that for a person to master something, they need three teachers. Whether it be music, a uh, game of tennis, or it be a uh, professional work in something where you work at a genius level. You need three types of teachers. Now, sometimes in life, we don't get to have all three teachers, but three teachers are important. Let me give you an example of music. When you're to train a child, the first teacher that you bring to the child must be a teacher that help the child love the music, if it's music. So the teacher might not be a genius level teacher or super, super good teacher. But the teacher has a way of inspiring the love of music. Or if it's like tennis, like let's say our uh, Mohan, he's a tennis coach. Um, to produce the next generation of professional champions, uh, there are certain type of things that are important. The first is to cultivate a love in a child of tennis or music or architecture, whatever you want the child to have. So that's the first type of teacher. Unfortunately, in my life, my life might turn out different. Uh, if my first Chinese teacher had cultivated in me a love for teaching, a love for Chinese, unfortunately, my first Chinese teacher, you know, is a, Sepusa and a disciplinarian uh, kind of the Sepusa no, teacher. When you get it wrong, uh, you get whip on your hand. Now it's forbidden, but in those days, your hand get, and your knuckles get knocked by the ruler. And I never look forward to Chinese class because the teacher didn't cultivate in me a love for Chinese or the Chinese language. So he totally failed. Of course, not everybody is like me. Some people still go through and still learn, right? And, um, but if you want to teach for child of music, the first teacher should be a teacher that cultivate a love for it. That after the tutelage of the teacher, the child just love whatever subject they're supposed to learn. Then the second teacher must be a disciplinarian. Because no matter how gifted a person is, without discipline, a person won't succeed. And so the second teacher must be still very good, but has a professional discipline. So that uh, I know I have met, I don't know any of you met anyone, I met a PhD in music. And to achieve the PhD in music, he does eight hours a day in music. And he came and lectured uh, for, he was a reasonably young person and my professors were enamored with him because of his brilliance. Uh, and uh, he could play any music and he had his own touch and for him, he specialized in bringing the seventh, uh, the seventh note uh, into play. Uh, and you can tell when he played, everything was different. And so, uh, to be very, very good at something, you must be willing to discipline yourself where you can keep doing it over and over and over and over again.
for four, five, six hours every day. I know some Olympic swimmers who get up at 3 or 4 a.m. They swim for two, three hours every day without fail. And then by the time most people get up, they think, okay, that's the beginning of their day. But their day began two, three hours ago. And they develop the muscles, the uh, equilibrium, and the sense of the swimming until it's like uh, second nature to them. Uh, then from there, they can develop other techniques. So it's my uh, understanding and belief over the years of wisdom that the Lord taught that the second type of teacher needs to be someone who encourages discipline. Now, this second teacher might not be so good because it's more hard. And then the final teacher, if can be found, must be a genius. Someone who is at the genius level that can impart only what genius level can impart. Then you can produce super, super musicians or super, super tennis players or whatever it is. And um, so I'm sure if, if any one of you, after you learn tennis and you get coached by uh, Rafael Nadal or, or the Swedish guy, I forgot his name, uh, you would gain some points for him. But only at a higher level. At the lower level, beginning level, you probably don't get much. You have to be a higher level where you can see the nuances, the small differences in how the person approach. And with that, I want to share that sometimes in life, when you're helping another person, you could use the soft approach. That is like the first teacher. But sometimes the person is at the place in life where they need the second type of teacher, the hard approach, the disciplinarian. And then if it's the Lord's will and the person really do well and progress, then you need the genius teacher to teach a person at a higher level. In anything in life, it's important to have that. And uh, you probably have the book Acts 15 by now. Uh, and in the book Acts 15, and I have some questions for each one of you. And um, in Acts 15, after the Antioch uh, conference, they delivered the letter. And then this incident happened in verse 36 to 41. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention, the word contention is like the disagreement between them, became so sharp and they are both strong men that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria, Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, here's the thing. You cannot say that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. Although I have heard preachers preaching that. Just because Mark came back to him, doesn't mean that Barnabas was right. Because Paul was not giving up Mark, he was giving up Mark for the time being. Because he is an important journey. And the fact that Mark came to him at the end of his life instead of Barnabas, I believe is because Mark found that he can only learn so far with Barnabas. To get at the higher level, unless you and I disagree, I will say Paul is a genius level at apostleship. So then Mark knew that he has to follow Paul in the end to learn. And he has to put up with Paul's disciplinarian way to learn from Paul. And I don't think Paul compromised on disciplinarian ways. And so here's a good incident to show unity in diversity. Now, in the Apocrypha that talks about this incident, it says that both of them prayed for each other and then they bless each other. So they did not quarrel and then depart. They, they bless each other. They understood each one have their role. And, um, and here, 
Notice that God never stepped in. God will step in where there's a wrong or right. Like for example, with Aaron, Miriam, and Moses, there is, wrong, there is a wrong there. But here, they are different. If Paul were becoming a soft person, Paul would not succeed doing what he did. On the other hand, if Barnabas is not soft, he will not succeed in what he succeeds. And here's the case of unity in diversity. For a time, Mark probably need to be under uh, Barnabas until he pull up his shoe strap and become a more disciplined person. He's a bit lax. And so in this case, there is no right or wrong. But there are two different people dealing with Mark. And for Paul, he cannot take that because he has his performance and task. And Jesus is measuring him on his success too. He cannot be pulled down. So in the end, when we look at this incident, I'll say unity, unity in diversity, it comes about, I believe, through people understanding each other, accepting each other. Paul never say that Barnabas was wrong. Nor did Barnabas say Paul was wrong. The way the story goes on shows that Paul was still moving in the Lord. Like I say, there are many mega churches, many big ministries. Each mega church have their own success story and have the people they reach out to. We have ours. And the Lord personally has shown that there's a certain disciplinary level necessary. And we welcome everyone to be in Christ and go to any church they want to. And you can attend the church that suits you most. But if you find that our church suits you best, so be it. We will continue to train you. Each church has its strengths and its weakness. Of course, when you are strong, your strength will be your weakness. That means if we are used to long worship, which we will go back to, the day will come when we will worship for one, two hours solid. Then we preach for one, two hours solid. Most churches go half an hour worship, half an hour of message, and that's it. And some Christians are happy with that. We have no quarrel with them. But if everybody is like them, then how can, how can we train other people whom the Lord want to train more strictly? So there has to be the differences because each one has their own way of dealing with things. At the end of the day, of course, the measurement is success. And one should not judge too early and say he's right or wrong when you haven't seen success yet. But numbers cannot say, oh, I'm successful. He can't because... Show me the success. So when we deal with people, success is not based on instantly, oh, my matter is right, your matter is wrong. Success in the end is based, number one, by Jesus. How Jesus value and is dealing with each life. Number two, in the end, success is a person walking closer with God. If a soft method does not bring a person closer to God for two, three years, my suggestion is try a different method. So success is measured by the person in the end growing closer to Jesus. Of course, the person can reject and refuse a different method. Then that's not anybody's responsibility. If Mark didn't want to follow anyone and go his own way, he is no longer Barnabas' responsibility nor Paul. So it's important to see whether the person really wants to change their life and come closer to God. Don't claim success before there is success. Because success is measured in years. When you deal with this ministry and the things of God, you will understand by now that our patience is measured by years. I'm willing to wait and see. 
over the next five years to see the method that is successful. But don't claim success when there's no success yet. A method may be rejected or accepted, but it's measured in the end by its effectiveness on people willing to accept. Of course, some people will never accept a method. Like, for example, I say you need three teachers to be very good at anything. So some people, they are happy at the first level. They don't want to progress. Their relationship with God is, uh, I got enough money, I got enough blessing, I got good life and not too much suffering, which they don't realize will rob them of reward. And not much achieved in their life except in their own day-to-day -day, uh, things. And that's it. Some people are happy with their life. And you know, I would never be happy with that life. And some people would be more disciplined and they push a little more. They're sacrificial. And, um, and then they have a certain level of success. And I will always say, wise people, don't be too shallow. When you see a shop open and then it's successful, don't think that. And even today, with all the persecution, we still continue to continue preaching and ministering. And I know that it's because there are people hungry out there. And we have 10,000 followers out there. Let me tell you, this is not by accident either. Of course, in the end, it's God. But it's a lot of sacrifice, prayers, to see the vision God has, to examine through downloads, to wait upon the Lord for new fresh revelations, to take time to wait upon the Lord and pray until you get into the heavenly mode and enter heavenly vision. And the people who are following us are people who are sick and tired of normal church. They are also sick and tired as normal Christianity. They also sick and tired of just wanting to be successful on the earth and with little suffering. The people who are following us are hungry to follow Jesus all the way, believing that the rapture is imminent. It's not time to play church when the Antichrist is already born in your same generation or the false prophets. So the people who follow have probably read the Bible cover to cover. I can tell from some of your questions, some of you know your Bible very well. But after reading the Bible cover to cover, you're still looking for man or woman or God to explain some things in the Bible that is puzzling you because there are a lot of people who don't have Bible experience. And you're looking for someone who have talked with Jesus, met Jesus, been to heaven, seen the glories of heaven and come down, like Paul say, not knowing how to speak in English language, the mysteries that God has shown. But as we teach topic after topic, let's understand there's unity in diversity. You will always be given permission to disagree you will always be given permission to do it your own style. In fact, I encourage people to do things your own style. You will always be encouraged to hear God yourself and follow God. You will always be encouraged to follow God according to your conscience. That's good, isn't it? Yes, it should be very good. But give me the same Give me the same liberty. As much as I gave you the freedom to do it your style, as much as I gave you the freedom to hear God and act out the way you know God is speaking, then do the same. Give me the freedom. Don't judge me when I take a certain action, when I do a certain thing. Do the same. That's all. And if all of us could do the same, we have unity in diversity. It is when criticism, judgment, misunderstanding, or thinking that your way is the only way to do things, while I will never insist my way is the only way to do it, but 
I will insist that when I do something, if I'm in charge, let me do it my way. Because I know one thing for sure, that to deal with every case, there could be five or ten ways to deal with. And if you are in charge and you're doing your job, I will not, in, I will not interfere. But if I'm doing my job and I'm the surgeon operating, I say there cannot be two red Indian chiefs, only one at a time. So remember that when we plant churches, when we grow things, when we do things, that depend on hierarchy, who is in charge? If I'm in charge, give me the grace to do it my style. If you're in charge doing your part, I will give you the grace, salute you, by all, by all means, do it your style. I hand it over to you. If a person doesn't want to take this road, they want the other style, or the, they don't, in fact, the person might choose neither style, then I wash my hands. I say, if the person wants to follow, this is a time to discipline a person because the person might have to be the second type of teacher coming in. Especially if I see that a life is not improving. And that comes also with bringing up children. And here, when you look at Paul and Barnabas, there are different ways in which they approach the situation. There are different ways that they believe they will be a benefit to Mark. That Mark must pay the price. Uh, being cut off before he appreciates what it's like to be with Paul. So each has their way. And sometimes people have different ways because, number one, different cultural approach. Sometimes our own culture and background approaching differently. Number two, personality. Two persons have different personalities and they will approach the same subject twice. Now, as I say this, remember, you can apply it to all relationships. Because if you're going to work with another person and to work with even with your spouse or your family members, you have to understand that. And then third, different revelation. A person may have a certain revelation how to deal with a certain thing. Another person might be different. Just like sometimes you've got two surgeons and they want to approach brain surgery or surgery differently. But even in a hospitals and a specialist place today, you cannot have two surgeons with two different ideas. You're going to cut here, cut that, cut here, the person will die. You have to let one of them be in charge and you follow the cue. You cannot have two person, two red Indian chief handling the same thing. And um, so it's important. And then there are uh, differences based on different experience. And uh, uh, when you have dealt with uh, hundreds of thousands of different type of people, you might have different experience for a person who deal with 1,000 people. So experience also could be very different. So there are many, many diversities. But the most important thing, as we can see here, as in all the sharing is, whoever you deal with, whatever you deal with, don't judge. Give the person the freedom the way they think they is right. And it depends who is in charge. If you're in charge, fine. And if the person passes to you, fine. But if the other person is in charge, don't criticize. You cannot criticize a surgeon while they're operating. You cannot criticize a painter while they're painting. And no two painters are the same, correct? So when a painter has not finished a painting, you cannot judge. Because they got their style, their stroke of painting. And perhaps in the end, if uh, let's say person A, person and, and your X and Y. And so X and Y differ. Then in the end, person A rejects X except Y, but Y bring to a certain extent like Barnabas. But in the end, they cannot grow. They know to be the master painter, you need someone who is very strict, very disciplinary to reach that top level. So in the end, a person might still need that kind of discipline. Uh, and uh, so in the end, success is important. Success is important. It's measured by actually the person changing and improving. If the person doesn't improve but digress, then obviously there's nothing to boast. But many times the person would not go to X or Y. The person would go their own way. And then 
everyone just have to wash their hands and wait until the person decide want to be closer with God. So in terms of relationship, there are a lot of dynamics between lions and eagles and face of the eagle, face of the man or the calf. Today, I'd like to bring you a step closer to couples. Let's examine couples in the Bible, hoping that in each one of your life, even if you're single, you still have to relate to somebody to work with. Or if you're married and you have a spouse, you understand how to be more harmonious with them. And also some of these principles, which we will apply more directly next week, apply to working together in ministry and apply to uh, possibly even working in the business world or working in many other aspects of life where we become skillful in learning to work with people. So here, we take the first couple, Adam and Eve. And um, so with Adam and Eve, I would think that Adam had a strong character, but Eve had a stronger character. And of course, it's not fair to classify them in one of the four systems because before they fell, they were perfect. But I would think that in Genesis, Adam being the head and being the first, would possibly be like an uh, eagle. He got the revelation of God. He's walking in God's revelation. <clears throat> but at a certain point, Eve was leading the relationship. Remember, even though there's equality, you still need a chairman. <clears throat> it's just like, People can be shareholders in the company. They're all equal in shareholding. But when it comes to decision, one has to be chairman. So here in the relationship, Jesus always makes the man the head and uh, <coughs> doesn't remove the importance of the woman. But you see here when they were punished for disobeying God, this is what God said, who can argue with God? God punished Adam in verse 17 of Genesis 3 because, now if you disagree on all this, please write down your note. You can bring out Q&A and share your opinion. But in verse 17, God told Adam, because you heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, of which I command you not to eat, this is your curse. Now, in the relationship dynamics of Adam and Eve, Adam should have been leading the way. And when his wife plucked the forbidden fruit, he could have stopped the wife if he was there, rebuked the wife if the wife was there, or if some of you are more Australian, you know, rugby tackle the wife and stop her before she reached the fruit. Uh, but in the end, after the wife ate the, take the fruit, and before she ate it, he could still try to stop her. There's so many, think about it, how many microseconds did he have to stop the wife? He could have stopped her, uh, I assume he was there with her, before she plucked the fruit. He could have stopped her after she plucked the fruit, but didn't eat it yet. And then after she eat the fruit, he could have stopped it there and don't eat the fruit. Of course, we all do not know what the result will be if it's at those level. We don't even know what the punishment of God will be. It's all curious to all of us what it's going to be like. But we see here that he went the fourth step after the wife took it, eat it, the wife passed it to him. He still could choose not to take it. But he chose to take it. And God says, by doing this, you're listening to your wife against my word. So it was God's word against Mrs. Adam's word or Eve. Adam fell. And... Although not much is mentioned in detail of the emotional state, in the book 
of Adam and Eve in the Apocrypha, it shows how miserable Adam was several times tried to commit suicide unsuccessfully. But in visions that I saw of this situation after the fall, the wife has a, what I call, um, uh, okay, let's continue and do the best we can kind of attitude. She really uh, had that attitude to go on. And Adam was very, very depressed. So in Adam and Eve's relationship, and because on the internet, it's very hard to do it on every, every case, which if I were a live audience now, I would probably get the live audience participate. But I have to adapt my preaching to online, which is a bit more difficult. And so sometimes I do, I get your interact, but that will take more 10, 15 minutes of interaction. And we go to one side before I could cover more topic. So uh, I will let you disagree with me in the Q&A afterwards. So in my opinion, Mrs. Adam was very strong. I would say, if I want to class them, Adam was an eagle. Uh, you can disagree with me, of course, because this is not set in cement or stone, and this is just perspective that we can, we can do. And I believe that Mrs. Adam was more like a lion. She's just very bold. Go and do things. Even after the fall, she's just like a can-do attitude with her life. Um, so I would say, in Adam and his relationship, Adam was supposed to be the head and leading, but he's slow. The wife was fast. And um, the wife took action faster than him. And um, he was punished because of the action of his wife. And uh, later on, you see that uh, Eve was punished for listening to the serpent. There is a wrong and right here. Uh, it, they both went against God's command. But Eve was a very strong person. The fact that she could influence her husband to eat the fruit. Of course, some of you think that she didn't influence. She was just beautiful. And when she said with a sweet voice, uh, Adam, eat this fruit. And then Adam, Adam would soon and say, Oh yeah, darling, I eat the fruit. And you would have thought that was it. I don't think so. This is just for the movies or for drama. I think overall, she just had a strong personality and Adam, when it comes to her, had a weaker personality. So, my conclusion, which may be wrong or right, you can critique it afterwards, is they are very one in their DNA, in their spirit, after they came for each other. And um, they're like twins. but the woman was the stronger one in this relationship. Now, being strong, being slow, being fast is not a disadvantage necessarily. It's only a disadvantage if you disobey God. When it comes to God, God must be number one. So anyway, that's the first major relationship. The second couple I want to look at is Abraham and Sarah. Now, Abraham and Sarah, their age difference was about 10 years. And um, I would say Abraham was a strong character. <laughs> Reading the book of Jesha, I would say he's a strong character. He dared to burn all his father's idols. Uh, he's a daring man. Uh, strong character, leadership man. Uh, Abraham, he's both like... Uh, to me, like an eagle, being a prophet, and also a lion. He, he, he's very bold to take action. The good thing is that he was married to Sarah, who was a bold woman also. So what you have is a lion and a lioness, with Abraham having some eagle aspect. And you will say in a fairy tale, uh, 
and they live happily ever after. Not quite true. Because they had a lot of things going for them. We see here that um, it was Sarah's idea that Abraham have a child through Hagar. Now, Hagar was a maidservant who came to them after the Egyptian trip. Among the rewards that Abraham was blessed with in his deception, that Sarah was his sister, was he was given maidservants, men servants, and lots of other things. So it was Hagar who came at that time. So Hagar actually was from Egypt. In chapter 16 of Genesis, says in verse 1, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar. Sarai said to Abraham, See how now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall have obtained children by her. Then Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. Now, I know later on, Hagar became proud, contemptible, and then it spread to her son, Ishmael too. We already touched on that. I will not touch on that today. Today, I'm going to focus on just the couple. It's couple um, counseling. So here, Sarah was strong in suggesting that. And it says here in verse 2, the last sentence, and Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. So Abraham listened to her. That proves that Sarah was strong, influential, and Abraham followed her. After they have the child, Hagar's attitude changed. And then Sarah came to Abraham in verse 5 and says, my wrong be on you. Oh, it's time for blaming each other. I gave my maid to your embrace. When she saw she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. See, when people start doing that, uh, the Lord judge, the Lord judge. That's terrible. There's no unity in diversity. No accepting the each person's style. It's different, but not necessarily wrong. So it's like, you know, Abraham, you're wrong. <laughs> I told you she was a strong woman. And then Abraham said, you see how weak Abraham was. Abraham said, oh, you do to her what you want. And so she treated her harshly and cruelly until she ran away. And of course, she came back again because the angel instructed her that, that she has to come back. So. Here, I believe it was wrong for Abraham to listen to Sarah. So I believe Sarah was also wrong because there's no thus says the Lord. There's no revelation. So remember, in every relationship, whether it be couple or ministries, do you know to me what's the most important thing? If you don't understand now, I hope you catch this phrase very carefully. The most important thing is who is hearing the Lord? Who is hearing the Lord? To hear what the Lord wants to do. So in this particular case, Abraham didn't hear the Lord, nor did Sarah. They were both wrong. So they produce a child that became a problem even up to today. The Israelites are fighting with the Ishmaelites. And so there was trouble in the home. Finally, when Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah gave birth. And after Sarah gave birth, It came time in which um, 
no family, you know, hopefully they could live happily ever after together. But no, that did not happen. And the Bible tells us about what happened after um, between uh, the, the quarrel that continue, continue happening after Isaac was born. And when the child grew and was weaned, that is chapter 21, verse 8. Isaac has finished breastfeeding and most of the time watching the ancient people and reading history, they could be between two to five years old possibly or less. And Abraham made a great feast on that day. And on a day that was to celebrate Isaac, you know, uh, stop breastfeeding in verse 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, that is Ishmael, scoffing. Now he must have got that from the mother. Therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this born woman and her son. For the son of this born woman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was displeasing in Abraham's sight because of the son. So they have this couple quarrel. And uh, how many couples sometimes they quarrel, they are not pleased with each other's statements or decision making. And this happened in Abraham's life. But in verse 12, God came into the picture. Now, when God comes in, who can question God? God said to Abraham in verse 12, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your born woman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be. And you also will make a nation a born woman because he's your seed. So God actually came. Now Sarah did not consult God. She just reacted in a situation and said, you know, I want this one woman out and want the son out. It so happened that was the will of God. See, at the end of the day, it's the will of God that's important. It's not your will or my will or your right or my right. It's, it's not anybody's opinion that's important. In the end, the will of God is to be done. And so here, God told Abraham, Listen to Sarah. Now, isn't that contrast? Because uh, 13 years ago or, or more, uh, he listened to Sarah and he made a mistake. Now God told him, you got to listen to Sarah because she's on the right here. And Abraham's heart and emotions were not that uh, happy. You can see he probably didn't have a good night's sleep in verse 14, because he's still attached to the son. And uh, he rose up early in the morning to send them both away. And it's, uh, it's not mentioned in our Bible, but in Apocrypha and in Bojesha, he keep in touch with them from time to time. But he sent them away, far, far away. You see, sometimes some churches teach, I don't know how they do couple therapy. Some churches teach that, your wife is right all the time, listen to her because she's a weaker vessel. Nonsense. Adam listened to Eve and got into trouble. Abraham listened to Sarah and got into trouble. However, neither is it wrong to listen to your wife if your wife is speaking from the Lord's perspective, whether she knows it or not. So it's not a question of listen to the husband or listen to the wife. It's a question of who is having the will of God and speaking God's will. So in this perspective, I would say Sarah was a lion. She got her way. And after that, you don't hear much about them having any disagreement. Although like any couple, they probably have small, small ones, but not so big that the Bible has to write about it. Abraham was a strong person. But he was a very caring person who uh, would go the way. In fact, at first he did not want to listen to Sarah. He was very unhappy, displeased. But God says, don't, be, don't let it be displeasing to you. This is on my will. Just let the, the born woman go and her son go. 
So this was the situation between Abraham and Sarah. They are very strong characters. Sometimes Sarah get it right, sometimes she get it wrong. Abraham sometimes get it right, sometimes get it wrong. But there was also something in their life that should be pointed out. You see, they agree with each other. And you can see that story before they go to Egypt. That um, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, in verse 11 and verse 13, they have some sort of agreement that every time they travel to protect Abraham being killed, actually this out of fear. Any decision made out of fear is not a good decision. A decision must be made out of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So obviously, this agreement that they have was made from fear. The fear that Abraham will be killed and they will take Sarah and then, uh, uh, and then marry, uh, marry her away. So out of fear for his own life, Abraham is a lion Jew, got Sarah to agree that whenever they travel, people ask, Oh, you beautiful woman, who is that? Uh, is it your husband? Say, no, it's my brother. And then Abraham will probably give a very sly smile and say, yeah, it's my sister. Both liars. They agreed to lie, a half lie, but it was not good. Because in the end, it caused trouble and sickness to other people. They did that again with Abimelech. So we know this is a habit that they have done which was not definitely or not of the Lord. Don't anyone you dare to say this is the Lord telling them to do it. The Lord doesn't tell people to do this. But the Bible did record that when they came to the place of Abimelech, which is the Philistines in chapter 20, Abraham in verse 1 and 2 told uh, Abimelech, she's my sister. Got them into trouble again. So, even strong people can make agreement that is not from the Lord. And they should have broken the agreement when the Lord began to reveal more Himself and trust their lives to the Lord, which the Lord has shown He protect their lives. But this arrangement that they had was not of the Lord. Sometimes couples don't seek the Lord, don't hear the Lord, out of their fear. They both are one. And it looks like unity, but it's a unity of fear. It's not the unity of faith. Even Ephesians 4 is a unity of faith, not a unity of fear. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must have God's word. So this is not from God. But they have a unity of fear where they will lie and say they're just brothers and sisters. And that has to be broken. Because it was not broken, it somehow got passed down to Isaac who did the same thing. Not good. I'll say it was not good. So when we examine the relationship between Abraham and Sarah, sometimes Sarah is right, sometimes Sarah is wrong. And, and sometimes Abraham is right because he led them from their family, leave all behind and to move on to the land of Canaan. So he was right. He's a strong character to move the whole family there. So they are both strong character. But being strong... It's bad if you're strong without hearing from the Lord. So I don't know what kind of couples you all are, but I'm giving you some Bible example. Now let's look at another innocent couple at the beginning. That would be David. And so we hear the story of David in the book of 1 Samuel. And it was young love when David uh, freshly killed 
Goliath. He became famous as a captain in Saul's army, and he became best friends with Jonathan. But in the meantime, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 20, Michal, Saul's daughter, fell in love with David. And in the end, David married and became the son-in-law to King Saul. You know, they could live happily ever after if King Saul did not have insecurity. Along the way, the father-in-law developed insecurity. So their problem was more complex. Maybe some of your problems are more complex because you got the in-laws coming in. And as long as David was living under the covering of King Saul, David always got a problem with his father-in-law. And it was not David's fault. You think that all in-law problems are because of uh, uh, one party, not necessarily. Uh, so uh, here it's the father-in-law's jealousy of David that create problems for their marriage. At the end of the day, since we're focusing just on their marriage, Michal, who was uh, rightfully David's uh, wife by then, continued to love David and protected David. And... Um, Look at chapter 18, verse 28. Saul knew, uh, when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. And Saul became David's enemy. Imagine, your father-in-law become your enemy. Now, what a bad story. <laughs> this is a story for the movies, not for us. But it's in the Bible, so we're going to look at some parts of it. Now, Saul... Saul's daughter did protect David in chapter 19, verse 11. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him, to kill him in the morning. I don't know how many plots of, of assassination that David go through. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, if you don't save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. And Michal laid David down through a window. Wow, this is drama. And he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image, lay on the bed, used goat's hair, pretend that it's David sleeping. And then when they asked for him, he said, oh, he's sick, he's still here. So they cannot chase after David. I think Michal is really in love with David. And the two make a great couple. And um, then in the end, the father was angry in verse 17 and scolded Michal. Why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? In fact, Mikael should answer, What do you mean? Your enemy? He's my husband! <laughs> anyway, uh, Mikael said, it was the next line, he said, Let me go. Why should I uh, uh, kill you? <laughs> this, is a, this is a killing story. This, uh, although the Israelites, likes, it sounds like Korean drama here. And uh, anyway, David escaped and went along. And there is a sad thing in this story that uh, after all these things has happened in chapter 25, verse 44, because in those days, women don't have much say. They can be married off by uh, their father or the king or whoever. After David escaped and, 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 and went out, uh, their lives took two different roads. In verse 43, 44, David in the wilderness took Ahinoam of Jezreel. And also later he took Abigail as wife. But in verse 44, meanwhile, Michael was left alone. Her husband had run away. And don't know how many years had passed by. In the end, Saul took David's wife and gave it to Paul T, the son of Laesh, who was from Galim. Now, how shall we help this young couple? How should their story be? My personal opinion, I believe Michael should have run away with David. 
and kept him company all those years, then he don't have to go and have other wives and all the other nonsense. But uh, that story didn't occur. It would have taken her extra courage, extra strength, and she has to go against society. You know, one of the hardest things to go against is to go against what is common in society. In those days, women don't make their own decision. She will have to be a very modern woman uh, and understand uh, the, uh, how much she has to, uh, if she wants a good life, she has to fight for her life. But in those days, women were put down, pressed down, and they didn't have as much rights as today. So we don't have a happy story here. David and Mikael's marriage got broken. And in the end, Mikael was married off to another uh, person called Pal T. In meanwhile, David had two wives, Anayim and Abigail. The sad story is later on, after many, many, many years, by the time David was about 37 years old, when the northern kingdom wanted to unite with him, he demanded Mikael back. I, I mean, he demanded that he, he have her back. By that time, she said, it be another man. Of course, we do not know whether there are any children involved. But in verse 14, David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, uh, who was under the domain of uh, uh, Abner, uh, Saul's uncle. Saul's son saying, give me my wife whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins. And so part of the condition for uniting two countries was Mikael must be returned to David. And the sad, sto sad story was that that was arranged, but by that time, for some reason, and uh, her husband, Pelti or Peltiel here, was in love with Mikael. And it says when they sent for her to take her from her husband by now, it says in verse 16, her husband went along with her to Bahurim, weeping behind her. So Amna said to him, go, return, and he has to go back. So they had to break another marriage to take Mikael out. Sad story between uh, David and Mikael. And these are circumstances beyond their control. A lot of things happening. And when Mikael came back to David, Surprise, surprise, he got two other wives. How do you think she will go through? I'm sure by now, first of all, she must have been hurt. Don't know what happened to David. And David didn't send any people to get him. Of course, if she didn't run away with David, there's another story that could come on. David sent people to go and get Mikael secretly to come and join him. That could be another story. But neither did that happen. David was already with other women. And here to unite Israel, he demanded Mikael back. He broke another marriage. We know one thing, Petiel definitely loved Mikael. Don't know whether Mikael loved him back, but there was a lot of broken hearts going on here. A lot of hurts, a lot of uh, bad history. And when Mikael came back and David was celebrating the Ark of the Lord coming in, she also was wrong in a bad attitude because at a time when David was worshipping the Lord, that's not when you condemn him. So, but she was hurt. She had a real hurt. She come to David and David had two other women in his life. And when David was celebrating his love for the Lord in verse 20, chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servant, is one of the base fellows, shamelessly uncovers himself. It was a sarcastic statement, shaming David. And David put Michal away, and in fact, he never saw her again, nor slept with her again. 
So Michael went into another period of isolation, of misery and loneliness. What a sad life Michael was when she first fell in love with David. She never expected that the story of their life will be that way. In visions, I saw that she had an evil spirit that keep whispering all the wrong things to her about David. Possibly because of so much hurts and heartache she went through. You know, you cannot help what happened in life. How many heartaches you went through. How much hurt you go through. But it's important that you always hear the Lord who can heal you, who heals a broken hearted. And no matter how much heart, uh, heartache we have or hurts, your actions, your words still are not excusable. She could have been a better woman. But she spoke her hurt at the wrong time. At a time when it was David's highest point, she chose to cut him down. Basically, she is calling him a rotten person. That was her opinion of her. If you believe your husband to be a rotten person, you might not well don't be married to him. Because it's going to cause each other misery. But that was her opinion. She had a lower opinion of David now. And the thing missing in Michael's life was a love for God. If only she had a love for God. But David is also very funny. He already married a very godly woman who has another story. See, sometimes in some stories, you have the husband who is a good head and who follow God. But Abigail was in a rotten marriage. And Abigail, this is a description because their life is tied together. Got to mention her now. In verse 3 of 1 Samuel 25, there was a man called Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. He must have been a rich man, but he's a rotten man. And Abigail was a woman of good understanding, beautiful appearance, and the man was harsh and evil. So this is a marriage of good and evil. <laughs> I don't know how to call it. Uh, I was a good and evil. I mean, he's a good woman married an evil man. I don't know how their marriage survived. But I guess in those days, the women just submit and cannot say anything. It's not like our modern days where Jesus had brought equality to women. But Nabal hated David, didn't like David, and hated the Lord. He's the evil man, the Bible says. Abigail was a godly woman. It so happened that David in the wilderness protected their sheep and their thing. So David just asked for an offering and said, look, you know, now that it's harvest time, it's time you celebrate, could you give me some offering or presents? Because we actually have been looking after you too. And he insulted David. And when David sent the young man, he insulted David and says, in verse 10, call him a dog, basically. He says, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away from their master. Shall I take my bread and water, my meat, and share with you? And so he gave nothing to the man. And in those days, it was like the wild, wild west. Everything is settled by gunfire, but here is by sword. And when, the, when, when he sent David servants rudely, David got all his army to get put on their armor and they're going to march and kill Nabal. And one of the young men told Abigail, the master did this. And Abigail knew David had been kind to them, looking after them. And the young man even said, well, in the wilderness, 
They have been good to us. They didn't hurt us. They didn't steal from us. They were like a wall for us day and night, guarding and watching us. We feel secure with them there. And Abigail know what's going to happen. That David is going to slaughter the whole family. Abigail quickly took all the presents, everything. And she, she took 200 loaves of bread in verse 18, two skins of wine, five sheep, five seers of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisin, 200 cakes of figs, loaded them on donkeys. And she says, go before me and tell, am I coming after you? And so she rode down and then she saw David and his army coming to kill all of them. And in verse 23, she dismounted, she bowed down before David and said, please, don't do this. I summarize a long saying. She basically says, don't do this. Because next time when you are king, you will regret what you do now. Wow, what a wise woman. This is a good woman. First, she believed in the Lord. Then she believed in a prophecy because David is quite famous. And she believed that one day David will be king. And so she, she appealed to his conscience. And David listen. And then after that, when she told her husband what she did, her husband had a heart attack and died. And later on, David married her. So, David had good men in his, in his story. I believe Michal was innocent and good. But along the way, things happened and destroyed their love for each other. Too much heartache, too much unforgiveness. And they never got back together. I believe Mikael was like a little lion. She was quite brave to stand up against her father. If only she were a lioness and be more brave. If only David loved her more and went and get her. So things were complicated. If they did the right thing, it will be against all of society's norms. If they wanted to save their love and their life for each other, they would have to have New Testament revelation and, and understand to fight against society's way of treating women to win their love. But we didn't have that story, sadly. So it was a broken relationship. With Abigail, David should have been satisfied. For some reason, he was not. So there was still some emptiness in David's life. I believe Abigail was a lion. David, of course, was a lion. He's a bold army general. Abigail was a lion. David, I'm sure, recognized her godliness and her bravery. She would have been a good woman. But the fact that David asked for Michal when he has Abigail and Ahinoam shows that David was never, ever satisfied in his relationship. He didn't find someone that he could stop womanizing. And that said, there must be an empty hole in David's life. In the end, the one that settled David more was Bathsheba. But their story was not meant to be because Bathsheba belonged to Uriah. They sinned. Then, then that was when David was already a powerful king. The story is found in 2 Samuel. And the story of Bathsheba so recorded, I believe, 
so that we can learn. Second Samuel 11. David committed adultery and as a result, a child was conceived. And in the process, here's where David became the bad guy. In order to hide the adulterous relationship, David resorted to Uriah coming home by sleeping with his wife and then say that the child was his. It did not work because Uriah was a righteous man who, who loved his own teammates. And, and don't forget, Uriah was one of the mighty men. And in the end, David became the worst evil ever. He became a murderer. And God faulted him when he plotted to get rid of Uriah just to cover his own sin. God was not happy. And after the judgment from God that was delivered, and David repented and confessed, he composed a psalm too in his repentance. But it was not enough. In verse um, 15, the Lord struck the child and the child died. And David was in an emotional turmoil. I believe that was when David began to realize how important relationships were. You must be faithful. Don't go around womanizing. Women are not just pieces of meat, but they have their own uh, spirit and soul with respect, like Jesus, give equality to women. And David did something that in this Bible uh, was recorded that he fasted and prayed, hoping that God would spare the child. He repented, he fasted, but death has come in. So in the end, no matter what he did, after seven days, the child died. I believe in that time, God did something with David's life. And it is said that after the child died, in verse 24, David comforted Bathsheba, and then they had another child, and this second child was blessed by the Lord. Oh, great is the forgiveness of of the Lord. The Lord doesn't hold unforgiveness or grudges. The Lord forgives. And when David repented, he blessed a relationship that was illegal. And from Solomon, God chose his heir. Isn't it funny? I mean, if all things were perfect, Uriah and his wife would live on and on, and David would live on on his side. And Bathsheba and David should never have been together. But now out of all the imperfection, the clash of relationship, the clash of everything, of evil and good, and out of it, people die, people live. A lot of hurts and damage that passed down to his descendants. But David repented, God forgave. And when God forgave, he does forgive. And he blessed Bathsheba and David with this child. That he said that this child shall now be the next king. The child was Solomon. But at that time, there are people who knew about this. The prophets. Joab. The rest might not know because it was not published in the news. There were no newspaper. And Joab never forgave David for that because Joab knew that Uriah was murdered. And Joab must have suspend, suspected after some time that it's all about Bathsheba. And Joab never in his entire life, accepted Solomon. Joab developed 
unforgiveness. Oh, what a sad story of human relationship. But what I want to focus on, in the end, Joel also died because of his unforgiveness. Put it this way. When somebody did something wrong, you should not do something wrong. Two wrongs will make a right. You should keep doing something right. And sometimes one sin leads to another person sinning, another person sinning, another person sinning, and the whole thing becomes messy. But everyone has to answer for their own sins. At the end of the day, after Bathsheba, they will stop. Something changed in David. Who was Bathsheba? If you read, Bathsheba was a brave woman. And she knew she was like Esther. She knew how to speak things at the right time. When there was a plot against her and Solomon by one of the brothers who wanted to take over David's kingdom, it was twice it happened. One during Absalom time and one under another son closer to David being old. Their life was at stake. Bathsheba spoke up. Bathsheba consulted the prophet. And the prophet said that he will go in to speak with David. And they all address David. And then David proclaimed Solomon as king, which you read later in the story. But what we want to, we want to see is their relationship. David was a lion. He finally met a lion of his equal in Bathsheba. And finally, but there were a lot of potential. Mikael was a potential. Abigail was a potential, which I don't know why he didn't settle for. Bathsheba was the last woman that he took. And the rest of his life, David was faithful in that sense. So Bathsheba sort of probably was one of those that got used after David went through all that he went through, his repentance, his regret, something healed in him. And he did not go on to other women. But it was not a nice story because so many broken lives. But what I want to see here is, where is God in the picture? I believe that Michal was in the picture at the beginning. I'm sure it was of God. And if Saul didn't spoil the whole thing, if Saul lived to a ripe age and died, and then naturally the kingship would have passed on to Jonathan, and then Jonathan would uh, abdicate and pass it to David, David would still be king. It would be a very smooth transfer of power. That might have been plan A. And no one had to die. But plan A was killed. And then whatever plans, B, C, D, I don't know how many plans were killed. Until finally, David became king. And he was like, everything outside was going on well. He got his kingship, God fulfilled his prophecy, he has all his blessing but his heart was still hollow. After all, he never got over Michal. In the Old Testament, unfortunately, they don't have as much forgiveness as in the New Testament. One surprising thing about David, when he died and passed on the kingdom to Solomon, he told Solomon to take revenge. <laughs> so that tells me that he was still Old Testament, in spite of having some New Testament revelation. So a lot of unforgiveness in the Old Testament. And I believe it was unforgiveness that prevented Michal and David from getting back to plan A after all their story. And of course, some evil spirits involved. But something happened when David was completely broken. And he realized how much evil he has done when he repented something changed in him and he continued on with Bathsheba. So it became like a plan B. 
but not a very pretty, pretty picture. But in speaking about not a very pretty picture, I want to look at another couple. And this couple is not famous. You can say they are infamous. Ahab and Jezebel. So in David's life, we see that strong women were important to him. David was a very strong person who loved the Lord. But it takes another strong woman. Micah could have been that one. Abigail could have been the one. But even Bathsheba was the one who finally uh, filled David's heart. David's life was emotionally filled. But here's another couple called Ahab and Jezebel. Before I introduce them, let me read from 1 Kings 21, verse 25. And this is a summary of their relationship. There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. To those of you who are married, I speak to the man for a moment. Invest time in your wife. Because if your wife follows the Lord and your wife is good, it will be a best helpmate like Adam and Eve before they fell. But Ahab and Jezebel, they had a unity of evil. In fact, Jezebel was more evil than Ahab. And Jezebel stirred Ahab to do more evil. One example is in 1 Kings, when um, he wanted the vineyard of his neighbor. He himself, did not dare to do to steal his neighbor's vineyard. But Jezebel had no conscience. No conscience. And it says here uh, in 1 Kings chapter uh, here in chapter 21 that Ahab's neighbor was Naboth. And he was sharing the border of the land. And it says it was 1 and 2 of First Kings 21. It came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, say, give me your vineyard that I may have a vegetable garden uh, because it's next to my house. Uh, I will give you better than a vineyard. I'll give you money. I'll give you what you think is good. But Naboth says, no, I don't want it because this is my inheritance for my father. So nothing, no money can pay for it because this is his inheritance. And Ahab, in verse 4, was sullen, displeased. So I can see that Ahab is a man who wants to get his own way all the time. If you're a man or a woman who always get your own way all the time, and no one stopped you. The Lord never stopped you because the Lord, you know, gave you free choice. Your family don't stop you because your family, you know, uh, don't dare to stop you or not brave enough to stop you, not bold enough to stop you. Uh, your husband and wife don't stop you. <laughs> and in fact, if they encourage you the wrong way, it's worse. But a lot of, of church problems are caused by people who in the home have lost control. So if they had got their discipline at home, they would not have to be disciplined in the church or disciplined by society. A lot of criminals have no upbringing. Sadly, some of them, and there's a high percentage of them with broken homes and, and without proper guidance. They break the laws of a country. They end up in jail. They end up on death row. They end up being punished. You know why? Because no discipline in the home spread to society. No discipline in the home spread to the church. So may I warn you here, 
Your wife or your husband can be right or wrong based on the Lord. There will be a lot of differences that have nothing to do with right and wrong. I always say this statement, right is right, wrong is wrong, there is no compromise. And God expects that you as a husband or you as a wife speak out when you think something is going wrong. And when your husband or wife disobey the Lord, you are the first voice that they must hear. Yes, they may kick you, slap you, or do things to you, but you're the voice that must speak out. Silence is consent. If you see your children stealing, you see your husband and wife breaking the laws or stealing or killing, you don't speak out, you are guilty as well. So you don't have to let evil grow until evil is out of control. If you really love your husband or wife or you love your family, your brothers or sisters, if they do evil, you know, for me, I'm a quiet person. As I told you, I grew from a chess background. I'm more bookish kind of person. But after many, many long years, 40 odd years in the ministry, I've learned one thing important. You must speak out when there is wrong. Silence is consent. It doesn't matter whether the person listens to your voice or not. It doesn't matter whether the person will take heed. But God needs someone as a witness to say, this is wrong. And then you can walk away if you want. But someone must speak out. Not speaking out is also wrong. So you can speak out and the person don't listen. Wash your hands. Pray. But at least you spoke out. And so, Ahab and Jezebel are a couple where they encourage each other to do wrong. Apparently, Ahab is the one who always wants his own way. He's like a sport child here. You can see that. He's like a sport child. And as I tell you, because they don't learn these things when they're small, please don't spoil your children. If your children is wrong, they are wrong. Don't say your children is always right. Right is right, wrong is wrong. If you don't discipline your children, who do you think is going to discipline them? You know, next level of evil, the police, the judge, the jail. Right is right, wrong is wrong. You must speak out. Now, we don't always speak out to get people to agree. And you should know me now by then. That when I talk to people, when I tell people right and wrong, I don't expect results sometimes. But I still need to tell them face to face, this is wrong. God bless you. I hope you hear from me. Goodbye. Because they need someone to say that to them. From a baby, from a child, to their marriage, to their relationship, to their brother and say, no one told them it's wrong. That's why they are that way now. So here, he behaved like a sport child. And then his wife came and said, why are you so uh, cucumber face? You didn't eat your food. Then he said, oh, oh, uh, I, want, I want to get the neighbor thing, give him money uh, for all the he didn't have. And then the wife misuse of authority. It was seven. You can exercise authority over all Israel. I hear they think the king is above the law. No way. No one is above God's law. And so the uh, Jezebel being evil. She plotted false witnesses. This is violation of God's word. For thou shalt not have false witnesses. False witnesses, you know, penalty, perjury, death. So here, she got false witness who false witness Nabal. Got Nabal murdered. And after he was murdered, he came, he did everything in the name of Ahab, as you can read the story. He got get, uh, scoundrels, liars, to blaspheme him. And then after he, Neboth was died, and they say a lie about Neboth. They say, Neboth had blasphemed God and king. Then they stoned him and he died. All injustice, evil and injustice. And then she says uh, in verse 15, Arise, go and take the neighbor's land. Such an evil person. 
Have any one of you met evil? Evil sometimes has a nice face and very diplomatic. Mr. Antichrist is evil. Mr. False Prophet is evil. And they will be very diplomatic. But no compromise. So here is a couple that was stirring each other to evil. And I would say Ahab is like a mouse and Jezebel is like a devil and demon. Later on, their daughter was evil, who married a good king's son and nearly destroyed David's uh, entire uh, descendants. So this is evil because the law of God didn't come in. No one hear the Lord and no one stopped evil while it's still in the home and family. By the time Ahab and Jezebel ruled over Israel, it was too late. They propagate evil. Again, not a good example of a marriage. Notice, Ahab and Jezebel married and they never divorced. They were together in their enjoyment of evil all the rest of their lives. What a terrible couple. But in the end, they both died miserable deaths. So we look at Adam and Eve, we look at uh, Abraham and Sarah, we look at David, and there were three good women in his life. And uh, then we have looked at um, um, Ahab and Jezebel. And then we ask the question, how do we balance all these good people? And what kind of relationship can they have? Praise the Lord that in the Bible, there is a couple that you probably hear about. They are called Aquila and Priscilla. And sometimes the reverse. And uh, in chapter 18, verse 2, and this to me is the most equal relationship. You know, in Abraham and Sarah, they have almost an equal relationship. And almost, because at times Sarah was stronger than Abraham. With Adam and Eve, Eve was too strong. And Adam didn't hold her back. Adam's negligence led to the fall of all mankind. With David, David's emotions were not really there, but Michael was there. But somehow, they did not surpass the norms of their society and didn't have a happily ever after. Uh, even to great brokenness, they, they would end up with Bathsheba, which is not perfect at all. So no perfect examples. But Aquila and Priscilla, the Testament couple, they were like twins. Of course, a man is a head, but the woman had a ministry. And I present to you Aquila and Priscilla as the perfect example. Verse 2, he says he found a certain Jew, Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And so they were also departed from Rome and, and, he, and they both seem to minister together. It says here in verse 18, same chapter 18. Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila. Now you notice it reverse. Sometimes Aquila, Priscilla. Sometimes Priscilla, Aquila. And Aquila don't feel insecure. I mean, it's okay. You, you, you write Aquila, Priscilla. You like Priscilla, Aquila. Fine, because they all still end up with Allah. As long as there's Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla, Aquila, as long as there's no Delilah. We haven't looked at Delilah yet because there's not a perfect relationship between her and Samson. But here, uh, Priscilla and Aquila were companions of Paul and they travel. Then in verse uh, 24 to 26, same chapter, 
A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. And you notice one thing. Number one, they always do things together. It says they heard him. This time, it's, instead of Priscilla, Aquila, it's Aquila and Priscilla. They heard him and they took him aside and explained to him the word of God more perfectly. They could correct and improve a very learned man of God, Apollos, who later became quite a good preacher uh, and blessing even to the church in Corinth. So number one, they were united together in serving the Lord. And um, it doesn't mean that in a couple, both must be called full-time. Sometimes one can be called full-time, the other serve alongside or the other. Uh, where is that one women ministry? I forgot her name. And then her husband was a co-pastor or something. And that was good. There was some US couple. But um, sometimes the man is stronger, sometimes the woman is stronger. And you can't help it. It depends on calling. But as long as within the couple's own relationship, they have equilibrium. Where they both can hear from the Lord and they both respect what they hear from the Lord. So number one, this couple has an equilibrium. Sometimes it's Aquila, Priscilla, sometimes Priscilla, Aquila, and they both don't seem to mind it. No insecurity at all. You know, sometimes when uh, people pay too much attention to uh, the husband's side, the other side jealous, or the wife's side, the other jealous, they have to go no jealousy. Because for one of them to be prominent, the other is being blessed anyway. So that's the first thing you see here, their complete equality and unity. Number two, they both are learned in the way of the Lord. The way they can teach Apollos together. I always believe there's a man's perspective and there's a woman's perspective in everything. Men will never fully see the woman's perspective, only another woman can. And, and a woman could never see a man's perspective I said another, another man. But in this understanding of in the way of the Lord, in the things of the Lord, they both love the Lord and they both know the Lord. To me, that's important. Sometimes God calls one person to the public, one person to the uh, private side. Not everybody is called to the limelight. But in the Lord, both are equal. I would say Aquila and Priscilla are like the face of the man. They are teachers and they are some face of the ego. And they are very equal in the way they do things. In fact, from downloads, they both die about the same time also. And uh, when one night, the others will go home to be a lot. And they are really examples of true uh, unity in a couple. So they both are well trained in the way of the Lord and in the teachings of the Lord. It was not just Aquila teaching Apollos, but it's Aquila and Priscilla uh, that was there. And uh, this couple uh, continue strong in the Lord until Paul says um, uh, this of him in um, um, Romans 16 verse 3. When Paul wrote to the Romans, at one point, Aquila and Priscilla are there in Rome. He said, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also in the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Now, remember, Aquila and Priscilla came from Rome. And then at some time, they might visit Rome once in a while because they allow their home to become the church. I would say that, again, you see, when Paul wrote Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila got no problem. He was not insecure or jealous because they both uh, are there. 
And Paul, do you notice when Paul relate to them, it's always Priscilla and Aquila. But when it's a ministry, it's Aquila and Priscilla. Because Paul, don't forget, he's a single man. And of course, he probably have not been close to any women, although there is a testicia in the Apocrypha. But, you know, living under the same roof is a different thing. And um, so he had lived with them before. And I'm sure Paul must have been touched by Priscilla's hospitality. And uh, that's why he always mentioned Priscilla and Aquila, because he mentioned her first because he appreciated this woman serving him because Paul had no woman in his life, although we know Paul has a sister. And um, so Paul always mentioned it that way, but Aquila doesn't mind. But the third thing you see here is that they use all their resources for the church. They were both sacrificial. And when you have a couple like that with that much sacrificial nature, I tell you, it's harmony all the way. Paul mentioned them several times more. In 1 Corinthians 16, 19, Paul says to them, and by that time, they have been to all over the place. He says, the churches of Asia greet you. And oh, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Where is Paul writing this letter of Corinthians from? Uh, some... Uh, most people think that Paul was writing from Ephesus. Again, they, they, they use their home for the Lord. And, uh, but as Paul is writing this time, he put it the other way. Uh, because here, for some reason, he put Aquila and Priscilla greet you. So these two are so equal. You mentioned which one first is still okay for them. And then even in his last episode, 2 Timothy 4.19, he says, in verse 19. This is last episode. Paul was an old man now, ready to go home. He says, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus and all the rest. So Priscilla and Aquila. This time he reverses it again. You see, these names keep turning one person than the other and they both don't mind. This is the most, what I call, um, mature couple that I can see in the New Testament. Their ministries are so effective. They minister to leaders. They open their homes for the church to use. They were sacrificial. Their equality in their relationship. They both know the Lord. They're both well worth in the Lord. And this is the best example of people who develop together. I believe when... Uh, uh, Aquila and Pris uh, become more eager. Priscilla also got the same thing. For some reason, their unity was in spirit, soul, and body. And I'm glad that God preserved a couple like that so that we know that in this end time, as God wants people to especially the 12 and others to combine together with 24 elders and work with the four living creatures, etc. That God need more couple to become like one. And the last point on Aquila and Priscilla, whatever they do is like the Trinity. You know, anything Jesus do is the Father and the Holy Spirit. Anything Holy Spirit do is Father and Jesus. Anything Father do is Jesus and Holy Spirit. Their unity is like the Trinity. What one person does is what the other person does. There's no disunity at all. This is like perfect unity of a couple. Prime example. And all their life to the last breath, they serve God together. I present to you the best unity that these two have. They are so close that you cannot even tell if one is lion and the other calf. One is eagle and the other uh, man. They seem to always be flowing together in all aspects that you couldn't divide them. This is the unity of the Trinity where they have become perfect in functioning as a couple.
Now remember, not all couples can have the same synchrony uh, and uh, not all, but at least everyone can have the same type of spiritual unity. And remember what soulmate is. Soulmate is a unity of the soul. It might take many, many years for some people, but as long as both love Jesus, like Aquila and Priscilla, both sacrificially will give everything to God, like Aquila and Priscilla, both know the Lord and, and are knowledgeable of the Lord and His doctrines, these are the things that make them so united. And they serve God together without sacrificing the other. May God bring for many Aquila and Priscilla. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you continue to bring about strong couples in the Bible, in our modern era. And no matter how, I know each couple is different. Some people will be like Aquila and Priscilla. Some will be like David and uh, Michal in a perfect way. Some will be like Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. And some will be like Adam and Eve before the fall. But we pray, Father God, that for all those who are here, those who have, uh, have marriages, those who are to be married in the future, and those who have their family or those who are pledged to a single life, you know each one. But we pray that Spiritual unity will come. A unity in diversity. A unity in the Lord. A unity to withhold judgment and to accept one another in God's love. A unity to do God's perfect will. We thank you, Father. Help us to be the church that you chose us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I pass the time to Colleen. And... Coordinate Q&A. Remember, you can disagree with me, but state your point and your observations and some of these couples that we have looked through in the Bible. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Uh, so now um, you can post your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself uh, to have your discussion with Pastor. <laughs> I was going to do a Q&A talk. Uh, and ask some of you how um, you think your relationships are. Is it like Aquila, Priscilla, Abraham, and Sarah? But I let you volunteer yourselves. Pastor, I'm sure Aquila and Priscilla, they didn't get to this state um, <laughs> without any struggles. Uh. It's just that oh, uh, 100%. It, it was uh, shown to us the, in the way the uh, kind of like uh, the completion. Yeah. But uh, the journey must have been tough also. <laughs> oh, yes. Nobody gets that way immediately. Mm. But I believe they experienced the same thing together. Mm. They both suffered persecution. That's why they chase out. Uh, they both must have gone through a lot together uh, and uh, their sufferings, their experience and their love for each other, I believe. Mm. I think there's something about suffering together, certainly. Yes, they were persecuted together, mm. chased out of Rome. Yeah, in a way, suffering together uh, also in, uh, binds people together. I think it's like... Um, Something that is observed not just from the Bible, but uh, many many philosophies and many cultures did observe this same thing. That as people who suffer and go through hardship together, it um, brings out, um, I think, a special bond in a way. Yeah. I think it's like the fire, you know, kind of like <laughs> melting the... Uh, the elements together. Yeah, I believe so. Mm. But I pray for each one of you in your relationship with your spouse that it will be harmonious. Mm. And, and it should be normal for every one of you to have love, joy, and peace as the main constant. And then the other things can come and go as, as you grow. 
as a question, is it okay to be shrewd as is mentioned in Luke 16? Was A or should we be different? Uh, I don't think the word shrewd is the right English word. You can say wise as serpents, harmless as doves. This is what Jesus wanted. You must have the opposite, harmless as doves. Then the wisdom is fine. So I rephrase your question as, is it okay to have cunning wisdom? I say by itself, no. Cunning wisdom must be matched with harmless as doves. Then only is it uh, usable. Uh, here's from Sagun. Other colleagues, suffering has also been found to destroy couples as well. <laughs> Some marriages never recover after the loss of a child, for instance. Yes, that is true, Sagun. And this is a good thing. Uh, suffering can either bring you closer or bring you further apart, but cannot remain the same. When you go through the same suffering experience, it either brings you closer or it breaks you apart. So it's your relationship. How strong the relationship? Can the relationship stand suffering? Mm -hmm. True. But good point. In fact, like uh, even we see uh, churches who went through persecution, people are fr friends, you know, friends together who went through half times, went through war and all that. Of course, you know, some has gone for the worst, but some mm -hmm. went for the better. It, in a way, I think in, through the suffering, you it cannot, I mean, in the end, there will be some change, one yes. direction or another. You cannot be remain unchanged. Yeah. All right. But uh, I guess in every relationship is both plus the Lord Jesus, husband and wife plus the Lord Jesus, or fr both friends plus the Lord Jesus, and then that will make the difference. Because with, with the love of the Lord Jesus and the faith, then it is possible to go forward and improve. Yeah. And I pray that each one of your relationships, I think one of the main things is communication and talking it out, not sweep things under the carpet. And it's to be able to talk together and uh, harmonize together. Okay, Sagun asks, what is the greatest ingredient in making marriage like Aquila and Priscilla? There's a common saying, love is not enough. But I think love is the greatest. What well, you're quoting from the world there, yeah, love is not enough. And uh, love is enough. But I believe it has to be practical love. Now, some people might ask me, what do I think about the, the book um, where it says people show their love in different ways? You know, some people it through action, sacrifice, some through words and all that. Uh, I've read the book a long time ago. I think I have the book somewhere in my library. And after reading the book, this is my conclusion. In the book, it concludes with, remain as you are, just understand each other. If you're action person, uh, accept the action. If you're word person, accept the word. That's the conclusion of the book. I disagree. The points of the book are valid. But I believe that we must go through all the different types of love. That means if you are an action person, you don't speak much, you need to learn to speak more. If you're a speaking person, you don't do action, then you need to action more. And if you will do it, it will change you. Like my father and mother never told me that they love me, but I know they love me. They show me their actions. But when I became a Christian, I knew I cannot do things the old Asian way. And so I was the one who told my dad when I came back from Baptist Seminary in a holiday one day, I said, Dad, I say, of course, I call him Pa. I say, Pa, I want you to know that I love you. And I give him a hug. And I told my mom the same thing. They never told me they love me, but I did tell them. And I find when I did that, because I'm more an action person than a speaking person, but I changed. So the difference is, uh, I, the book Knowledge is good, but the book leaves you as you are. To me, the book just tells you different type of love and it should say we should learn to do all those things and then we are more rounded. And so, uh, what is the greatest ingredient in making a marriage like Aquila and Priscilla? I believe they love each other with the love of God. They seem to be very sacrificial. They seem to possess the love of Jesus for each other. 
and every one of you will know by now that for any couple to continue strong in the Lord in this end time, it has to be not just your love for each other, it has to be the love that comes from the Lord for each other. Then, that to me is the greatest. It's because they had tapped on God's love for each other. Uh, there's a side question there. What causes autism? Uh, there is no simple answer to that. One, it can be caused from the DNA. Two, it can be caused by uh, sensitivity or sensorial realm. That means uh, uh, most of them, like they react to noise or things, they are more heightened in the area. Third, it can be caused by chemicals that they're exposed to even as a child, so, uh, and etc. So there's no one easy answer to that. Uh, here, there's a question. I want to be anonymous, Pastor. Did the Lord give you a word for single people? I'm going to <laughs> one day. I know, Alisa, the Lord hasn't given me a word for you on that. All I know is that um, the Lord is going to bless you in that. And, um, so to those of you who are, uh, I have no word for all of you single or in any area. Um, but I have this understanding that as you all go into the deep of depth of worship, you will find your satisfaction there. But there are some who commit their whole life to the Lord uh, as a sacrifice, and there is a different reward in that. Uh, Adam and Eve had good communication. Would there have been would there have been a fall about Cain and Abel? Abel was a more favorable to the parent. Did he not see the jealousy of his brother? Uh, Adam and Eve, I'm not sure whether they had good communication because Adam was not much of a chatterbox. He doesn't talk much. And, so, and they were the first couple. So we're not sure whether uh, they could communicate the thoughts but something was definitely not communicated properly. And uh, then about Cain and Abel, uh, by that time they were fallen and Cain had absorbed all the negative things. And he has his problem to deal with and Abel has his. And at that time, there was a, some level of innocence that, that they didn't see a lot of sin coming their way. So that was the situation. Uh, Paul Coy being naive uh, in, uh, in evil. So they didn't see evil coming. Uh, there's another question. Is there a choice for couples to continue a relationship in heaven? Uh, yes, definitely there is. And uh, next question. Can you explain the eight blessings of overcomers in Revelation 21, 7? Um, I don't know why you call it the eight blessing. <laughs> Let's have a look at 21 verse 7. He will come shall inherit all things and I will be his God. And he shall be uh, my son. This is um, uh, referring back to the seven overcomers. That means when you all uh, overcomes, then uh, all the blessings of the seven overcomers are there. And you notice calling God your God and your God's son is already included uh, among all the seven blessings. So it's like an overall thing to overcome. All right, praise the Lord. I read Paul and the thing about Paul is Paul never have a real life relationship, but he has a lot of revelation. And uh, when he wrote Ephesians chapter five, if the husband would love 
the wife as Jesus loved, and the wife loved the husband as the church loved uh, Christ, then there's harmony. I believe that's Aquila and Priscilla for you in Ephesians chapter 5. Praise God. And uh, Colin, any other comments from your side? Mm, no, I think uh, it looks like you have to pick up some people to ask them questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not easy because uh, I think everybody has their struggles in terms of uh, relationship and sometimes it's just so hard to express also um, uh, these things, especially in a setting in a small public. <laughs> yes. And I would say all couples have to struggle to food clothing shelter with them or without them. So their love has to be steady without food clothing and shelter. And then in the abundance of food clothing and shelter, it can distract them and they must still have that same equal love. So with or without food cleaning and shelter, it is a test for every couple. You cannot blame, blame the lack of it or the abundance of it because there are many couples without sufficient food cleaning and shelter and they love each other. And then there are some couples with so much food and clothing and shelter born with a golden spoon and they cannot find love. And so... Uh, uh, couples that don't have them think having them will have the solution wrong. Couples that have too much of it think that they can buy it also wrong. In the end, it's discovering Jesus, discovering uh, Jesus' love and using Jesus' love as the key criteria to love your spouse. That to me is the key. Uh, question here, the qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13, are they successive? By successive, I assume you mean they are one step, two step, three step, four steps. Um, they seem to be, but not necessarily so. Because, you know, some people are strong in one area, some people are strong in the other. I would not consider them successive in that sense. Uh, question from Malibo, I was listening to one of your fire chat sessions. Okay, remember this fire chat. You say something that got me curious. If you had been in Singapore during the lockdown, would God have allowed you to use transportation to Australia? Hmm, we never know. We never know. Because God just opened the door at the right time. I came in at a time before the Prime Minister at a time closed the door. And uh, if I not come in at the right time and Australia close the door, it is also very hard to come back in because there's not enough flags and not, not things. Of course, you can rely on transportation. So I would say at this time, I, I'm not sure whether that would have happened. Although I do know that transportation will be one of the things that we become very, very skillful with in the future. Uh, qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13, are they successful? So it's the same message. Okay, we did answer that. Praise God. Any other contribution to anyone? Remember, you can disagree with me because we're just analyzing the couples. So you might be able to analyze differently from your perspective. I can understand that. Oh, there's a question coming in. Pastor, I trust you're doing well. Yes, I am. Thank you. I once heard... Pastor Kenneth E. Hagin says there are four things that, oops, uh, let's speak again. There are four things that affect uh, relationship intimacy. Uh, money, religion, how many children they want, you remember well. What is your intake on this? Um, I'm assuming religion is already taken care of because I'm talking about Christianity. Outside in the non-Christian world, of course, it's a different dynamics. Um, how many children they want? Uh, no, I don't think it's limited to that. And um, 
So I believe that uh, those are just some parts of a relationship. Uh, by the way, I read all of Kenneth E. Higgins book and Kenneth E. Higgins might be good in teaching the equality of women where he answered the question about should women cover their head. But I've never read a good relationship book or husband and wife from Kenneth Hagen. So each man specialized differently. But I've read good relationship book from, what is this author? Let me try to remember. Uh, he's John. John was his name. Uh, he wrote many books on relationship and I think he got more revelation on relationships uh, than Kenneth E. Hagen. Uh, each person got their own level of relationship. And so you try to learn from everyone. And, I, and as you know, I love to read and I've read uh, all the different books. I forgot his surname. I know he's John. He wrote many books on love and he described many And his background was he came from Catholic priest background before he became charismatic. He wrote many, many books on love and it was very insightful, very insightful. And so I believe he has that revelation on that. Uh, here's another question. Uh, Hello, Pastor. Hope that you're doing well. Thank you. I am. Uh, as I was thinking about angels, these two words came to me. What does it represent? Subhatutisanya. <laughs> uh, they is just recording something in tongues. And uh, if you want the answer in tongues, ikupli so as you see, when you think and speak in tongues, um, just enjoy it. And then after some time, you will get the gist of what God is speaking to you. So just enjoy your tongues. Um, hi, Pastor. Hi, Elijah. Yeah, Pastor, I was thinking about the statement that the Apostle Paul made that um, it was the woman that actually was tempted and it was the woman that fell uh, yes. and it wasn't Adam. So um, uh, if I'm, um, how can one reconcile that with um, uh, what you just shared? That Adam maybe partake of the fruit um, by his own um, um, free will or was it because the woman asked him to um, partake? Uh, good question. I was thinking about that myself. And I want to ask you one question about Elijah. Uh, this is a fun question. If Eve were not around, would Adam have sinned? Hypothetically. Um... <laughs> That will be a strong one to a, a very difficult one to answer, Pastor. Because <laughs> and just do a guesstimate. Uh, <sighs> do your best guess. I'm going to ask because Colin. Pastor, to, so I'm Colin thinking, thinking. <laughs> okay, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about the millennium reign, and I'm thinking about those who were there, even though Satan was locked up. But the, you know, from Revelations, we know that some still fell. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then well, Adam had fallen. Mm. Somewhere if along Eve the line. Didn't come. If if didn't come. Mm. <sighs> okay, I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the ladies will say, Of course not, you're a man, you say no. <gasps> but let me get Colleen into the hot water too. Colleen, okay. may you have your opinion? <laughs> I think Adam, since he fell, um he has that problem. Uh, at some point, uh, he, I mean, without Eve, maybe, I mean, would Lord, the Lord create somebody else for him? But anyway, <laughs> he, uh, he, he, would have a, he would have a problem. It's just that the, the serpent was opportunistic and knew that um, the, you know, Adam and Eve has this bond, right? So of course, you know, Ad, Adam would listen to Eve and trust her more mm -hmm. and take, take her uh, influence and her um, uh, opinion. Uh, so the enemy used that as a, 
as a route to get to him. But uh, I guess if 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 he's not around, then he will, the the enemy might probably use some other ways. Uh, and mm. if he and he can fall through if he can fall through another channel as well. Uh, so it, what exactly is your long answer short? So if uh, so you're going this way, touching the ear. So without without if it's possible that also um Adam will fall as a matter of time. Okay, so you say he will fall in other ways in a matter of time. Okay. I have thought about this question for a long time too. Because of Paul's statement here, like like he mentioned. And Paul seems to think that um uh that without Eve, uh, Adam would not fall from 1 Timothy 2 verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing. They continue in faith, love, holiness, with self-control. I had thought about this question. If Eve never came, would Adam have fall? Uh, I got the same answer as Elijah. No, I don't think he will. He'll remain like an angelic person. But here's the other thing. When Eve came, it was to bring Adam to a higher level of perfection. It was like a risk that God took, a risk that Adam must take. Like, um, uh, what would they say in this way? Uh, No pain, no gain. Uh, no risk, no profit. So, um, no adventure, quote unquote, where you can die. No uh, higher discovery. And so, when God bring Eve into the picture, Eve came from Adam. So, God literally split Adam into male and female. And as I know from my downloads, when Satan fell, he tried to deceive spirit beings and, fall, and angels. He did not succeed in deceiving spirits that are under the wisdom. Because by virtue of that wisdom, they know what deception is. But there are other things besides cognitive wisdom. There is emotional wisdom. And so God brought into Eve an aspect of Adam that was brought forth and placed into the female consciousness. So there is a male and female, not just biologically, but also in soul and in the spirit. And that female intuition type of wisdom has yet to develop in Adam which Adam need to develop. And so the answer would be, no, he would not have fallen, but he would not reach the fullness of himself. To reach his fullness, he has to explore this duality of himself, the male part and the female part, and be exposed to the challenges of wisdom and knowledge at that time. Remember what they ate was a tree of knowledge and good and evil. And uh, it's very curious because you all asked this question just a few days ago. Uh, in fact, two weeks ago, but a few days ago, I was still there. Uh, Jesus took me to paradise, to, the, uh, to paradise, which is the garden part of uh, heaven. And I saw not only all the trees, I saw that, which I don't know why Adam did explore. I saw that in that garden, there were also famous trees, if I can use this word, famous in the Bible. So I saw the sycamore tree uh, that was uh, uh, a place that was used in uh, Adam's time and Elijah's time. Then I saw uh, a vineyard and that vineyard, like grapes, represent the church. So I saw, wow. In the Garden of Eden, each tree represents different virtues of God, but there were also trees that represent some of the things that God wanted to do by predestination. They were actually planted there, but Adam did not explore. And then 
he could not exploit finish before he fell. And then there was the fig tree, and the fig tree uh, is famous because the fig tree sacrificed itself for a parable. And then it was given an honored place in paradise. So as I looked through and I walked through, I was taken to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So when I was there, I was like, my consciousness, I talked to Jesus to thoughts. My consciousness was, why am I looking at this tree? And then my first question was, is this tree safe to eat now that Jesus has shed his precious blood? Or is it still the same dangerous tree that the Lord says, thou shall not eat of this tree? We already eat of that tree. And then as I wait there for quite a long time, I didn't know what to do. I was just looking and waiting for an answer from the Lord. And then there was an answer that came from the spirit of wisdom, not directly from the Lord that says, I think the Lord wanted me to discover it. And then I discover that, um, that after Jesus Christ went to heaven, when he cleansed everything his, with his blood, the tree is not safe to eat. Because we already eat of the tree of life in the first overcomer. And Jesus is like representing the tree of life. So when you have the tree of life, you can handle the wisdom. And then as I was, I took one fruit and eat, and then I said, Okay, this just feels like knowledge. That's it. And uh, you know, it's just like, it's good, but it didn't do the effect like it did of the tree of life. And so, uh, you know, in the spirit, you're led to certain places. You don't just wander. And although you wander, but it's still the spirit leading you. And then I realized that all this knowledge uh, in that tree cannot surpass the knowledge that comes from the Lord. Uh, because when you have the Lord in you, you feel all these are ah, just like normal fruit of knowledge. Uh, and the good evil is gone because of the blood. And then for some reason, I was taken and then I, I walked to the tree of life. And then as I look at the tree of life, and then I understood why Jesus took me to the garden. Because I keep asking, why am I in this garden? You know, I've been to a throne room, been to everywhere. Why am I looking at this garden? And then I saw the tree of life. And then the Lord showed me the tree of life. It was growing from the time that God first planted it in the garden. And it will grow to the revelation, to the 12 fruits. Then I saw the process. I saw that the tree grow into the 12 gates, which is like 12 different dimensions. So the 12 gates are the 12 fruits. And the tree has one fruit. And it's like it, the life flow through all the 12 gates and the 12 gates are at the same time, the 12 fruit, uh, which is the 12 season in the new heaven, new earth. So I knew that was what God wanted me to see. And then I saw the abundance of life and all those things. And then there's some secret revelation God gave me. And that is, uh, the Lord says that remember for healing, all they have to do is look at the bronze serpent. I say, yes. Then the Lord said, for prosperity, I want you to look at this. And the Lord showed me something to look at. So I say, wow, okay. Uh, let me teach on this another time because it's so deep. And, uh, and it's going to bring a lot of breakthroughs uh, in a lot, lot of people's life. And so uh, coming to this Adam and Eve, that if all they took was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then they got stuck uh, because it is like you cannot handle knowledge before life. It's like a child, you cannot drive a car until your leg is long enough and your mind, intellectual and understanding enough to obey the laws of the traffic. So it's like God never tried to stop us eating it. God was just trying to tell us we need certain maturity to handle the tree of life. We need a level of life. So when there's a level of life there and you eat a tree of knowledge, it won't harm you. And so Eve took of that because Eve was curious. Without the curiosity of Eve, without the exploratoriness of Eve, which Adam was obedient. He's always obedient. But Eve wants to go through all the boundaries. In fact, when she saw the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she told herself, 
if I eat any tree, this is the tree I want to eat. And so there was something about her that was there. Without Eve, Adam cannot be perfected. So that's the long answer. Uh, no man would not fall, but they will remain stunted. And at some point, Eve has to appear for man to reach a level of perfection. Wow, that was a long answer, even longer than this. <laughs> so, Pastor, this uh, Adam was in a way like an angel, right? Yes. Except that he was he's also got a body. Hmm. But we also see that through time, one third of the angels fell. Yes. After, after Satan. So if, if Adam was to live long, it also has a pos- he also has a possibility, or he has to be tested in a way. Mm. Still have to be tested. But he will be obedient, but he will be stunted. When, yeah. when Adam was... Uh, okay, sorry, uh, Elijah. Uh, no, uh, I was going to say that... Yeah, join the, the discussion, sort of Elijah. Line. Continue. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was going to say that in that same sort of line, um, it seems as though the New Testament also kind of like, um, uh, in a sense, put Adam as a type of Christ. So mm-hmm. if Adam was a type of Christ and Adam was supposed to reveal what Christ was to do, um, would there have been the possibility of him falling? So I guess that would be like a question to the other colleagues. Mm. Mm. there will not be a need for a second Adam if he is already perfect so Jesus has to come there has to be a second Adam and it is I think we discussed this also about it's a a matter of time before Jesus has to to come Um, maybe Adam if he didn't sin in his generation I don't know, if he, if he didn't have Eve, he probably would have the next generation or so. So that's also quite uh, mm. uh, quite interesting. Yeah. It seems that there is a... Uh, they must have uh, Eve so that uh, he would produce the next generation. But I don't know. I mean, uh, would, would God allow um, Adam to be kind of like reproduced without um, man and woman? No, no right. <laughs> definitely not. not. Not like, you know, uh, cloning. A... <gasps> yeah, yeah. Mm. But, but first, would there have been a possibility of him thinking um, his descendants into being? <laughs> because thoughts are also creative. Uh, what is that? I was asking, would there have been the possibility of, of Adam uh, maybe thinking his descendants into being? Because of that, um, because of thoughts being creative. Oh, okay. Uh, there is a difference in the creation that came forth from Adam and Eve, as opposed to the creation that you can create angels, God create angels, and angels were fully grown. Um, but by the fact that they were fully grown, they had a limitation in their emotional capacity, which we humans have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, also the Lord has set the pattern, right? Because uh, Adam, even when he was without Eve, he, uh, he has his animals that are male and female. Yes. So that's why, he, that's, why, that's why he said, look strange, right? The animals are male and female, why he, he, he doesn't have the, the female part. Yes. So, when Adam was, in a way, split into Adam and Eve, uh, then, like, uh, Adam has some, uh, some characteristics, Eve has some characteristics. So, uh, if they merge perfectly back uh, and work together, then, like Pastor said, you, there will be a greater synergy. Mm. But before that merging back, um, and uh, synergizing, it means that each one, in a way, has some lack. Mm. And that's why uh, Eve can be tempted. And that's why Adam also could be, could fall th- that time because he is, he mm. and Eve needs to be together perfectly, then there will be that perfection. If not by themselves, each one has the ability to fall. Like because you say, a variable has to be added which he will fall. Mm. 
So you are right, Pastor. B, if if he's not split into Adam and Eve, he would remain. He would be an angel, possibly at the best, but he cannot progress into something special for humanity. But I like to uh, identify that Eric did say, I disagree, Pastor. Paul is saying that Adam would still have fallen. Oh, well, it's good that we have that, that you can disagree. And, and it's not an essential doctrine, it's more hypothetical thinking. So, uh, so Eric is saying that uh, if Eve if, if had not fallen, Adam would have fallen. Mm. Pastor, yeah. actually, I would still say this, you know, that uh, if Adam did not get split into Adam and Eve, he would not have fallen. But Ad Adam, after splitting into Adam and Eve, can fall, yes. Can, can fall, even if Eve is not the one tempting him. Yes, agreed. Yeah. So this added uh, another dimension to the answer. Yeah, yeah a lot of dimension. Yeah. But of course, everything yeah. we're thinking is hypothetical. Mm. Mm. Yeah. First, I was also going to add to it that um, I guess that also ties in into today's um, lessons where unity now also becomes um, a strong force in a relationship because um, Adam, before he was split, all his members, in a sense, were united. But um, with the split now, they have to learn to unite in that sense, in, in, in agreement um, as to the things that they are instructed to do and all that. So... I mm. guess, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And Pastor, in fact, the, the emphasis on unity throughout uh, the Bible is uh, uh, emphasized that the Lord wants uh, unity and uh, Jesus prayed for the unity and the love in the, in, in the church. And um, in fact, we see that uh, the incident of the Tower of Babel is that if the people are all united, they can actually achieve great, great things. Thing. Uh, in Acts, they were united and they achieved great things. And the body of Christ has to be united to fulfill the fullness of the kingdom of God. So mm. this uh, disunity is actually exploited by the enemy even up till now. Mm. Uh, the disunity among humans, uh, husbands and wives, uh, even in church, um, all the denominations and all that. The, the enemy is using this as a, the, the weapon he used on, on Eve, he's using now also on, on people. Mm. And that's why Jesus uh, prayed for the unity of uh, the, the church mm. uh, in his last prayer. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. But it's interesting that uh, it was Jezebel, although Ahab was responsible, but Jezebel was a key to pulling Ahab to more evil. And in our story in the Bible, as it happened, it was Eve that pulled Adam down. And that was what Paul was emphasizing. Uh, we are just uh, doing hypothetical semantics when we are trying to pull it further to whether he will fall or not. So that's not an important question. But I'm glad that we can have disagreement there. Some say he will, some say he won't, which is fair enough because it's all hypothetical. Pastor. Yes, sorry. Pastor, can I just add something so that like um, I don't know, yeah, which well this is a this also reminds like you know when you teach about or uh, there's one time you mentioned about uh wisdom that she when she come over the earth she couldn't find a place. Yes, and, in the book of Enoch. Yes, and then you there is also one of your teaching that you teach us that the seventh spirit of God. There is a male and female. Likewise, mm. wisdom has a male and female uh, yes. version, a lack of better words. Mm. And also, like um, even like in your teaching about uh, God's cube, that is is also like even though if uh, I mean you you did teach us that uh, regardless whoever it is, whether it's Adam and Eve, mankind will still fall. And that it is still the uh, it is still in God's plan, because in the end time, uh, the Lord Jesus come and redeem uh, the woman by uh, the bride of Christ. It's like a personification, and it is the will of God that the bride of Christ uh, to join a new Jerusalem to uh, afterwards later on to be part of the Trinity. So uh, I I just um yeah it. it it's just like just felt 
led to link all the teaching that you have taught before. And just to, to bring everybody to remind this that, like you said, even though, um, yes, uh, uh, God said man is the head of woman and all this, but also like what you said, uh, without Eve, Adam will not uh, fulfill his predestination to be perfected and uh, unity, diverse, uh, unity in diversity. It just makes like it, it because I remember so there's one time that you said um, there is a female part of God that uh, God wants to reveal to during this end time. Yes. So yeah, thank you for today's teaching because uh, before this, I've always heard the uh, preachers teach on what uh, Apostle Paul taught. And sometimes um, different pastors uh, ca come with different revelation. But back in the past, it can also be as if like it's so depressing to be a woman. But throughout your teaching, it's just more enlightening that, you know, that God is revealing that everybody has their place in God. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. Mm. Oh, thank you for your contribution to the sharing. Let me see. Uh, do angels inherit eternal life? Of course, the angels who, who uh, have passed the test. Next question. Why was Job's, Job's wife spared? <laughs> was it to try to discourage Job? Uh, I have no answer for that. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure... Uh, how long she lasted? Uh, Bible is silent, or was it the same wife that uh, was still there when he produced the other children? All is silence. Uh, there is no. We can imply that it's the same, but we do not know what happened to the wife. So uh, we don't have the full answer for that. We only know that Job went through suffering and he prevailed. Another thing here, I think the weakness that Eve exploited in Adam could have been exploited by the devil as well. So Adam could have fallen if Eve wasn't cheap or wasn't created. Okay, good answer. So you're saying Adam would fall even if Eve was not created. Yeah, we accept that point. Uh, Eric also has uh, mentioned that point. Oh, there's some more. Okay, wait. Let me go down. Uh, how did Sarah, despite her strong personality, became submissive to her husband, as in 1 Peter 3, 5 to 6, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and not afraid of any terror. And that's the amazing thing. When a strong person can submit, it shows the power of submission rather than a weak person. And uh, it shows that though she is strong, she knew uh, hierarchy. She knew what is first, second, third, fourth kind of thing. She knew her place in the hierarchy. And uh, so that's good. To understand hierarchy and protocol is to understand the angels. When you work with angels, angels work with hierarchy and protocol. So angels know they are like soldiers. Who is on top, who is below. And uh, they will not mix up the hierarchy or the protocol. Uh, so that's, that shows the power of submission, especially when it's given when one is strong. Next question. I believe Eve was part of Adam being split to female. Therefore, Adam would have still fallen. Thank you. Good point. And... Uh, Next one, anonymous. I was moved to record this word yesterday. Uh, what he's saying about it says, this day is the day in which we finally have entered the time season of the supernatural, where God will do great and mighty signs and wonders and many, many, a thousand upon thousand, millions upon millions of miracles, signs and wonders will be performed all over the earth and many healings will be released upon the face of the earth. It's a time of great amazement as many people will manifest many gifts of the spirits and many gifts of healings. There's a good prophecy. Thank you for delivering that. Uh, this is the age of the supernatural. It shall be that those who do not flow with this 
times that are coming shall be left behind will perish. Okay, good word. Uh, next thing, what is the true place of meditation? True balance between meditation and God given the increase in meditation. Meditation is for three things. One is uh, to uh, absorb the word. Two is to train our soul. Third is to be in union with Jesus, the word himself. And so um, meditation helps us internally. As we know, we got some things externally, but unless it's counterbalanced by things internally, we cannot function. The power inside must be as great as the power outside. Then we can balance ourselves to operate the power upon. Next thing, we all go through a kind of emptying ourselves like a kenoxis of Christ before coming. That is true. If so, is this the twisted truth behind reincarnation? Huh? Where people think they have many lives before the present one. Mm, no. I know that reincarnation doctrine came from the devil. It's one of the doctrine of demons. So when they can get enough humans to believe it, the humans will be subject to their control. Um, number two, what happened to the memories of those who do not make it back home? Oh, uh, their souls will perish in a lake of fire. And just like when Satan is in a lake of fire, all his memories are also gone. Uh, and so he just uh, will suffer eternally there and in the end be absorbed into just pure energy. Uh, Pastor, why did Adam ask God to forgive? Oh, why didn't Adam ask God to forgive Eve? Ask God to return her to the original place. But Isaac prayed for Rebecca, tried to redeem her. Because the intercessor must have uh, be innocent. So a sinner cannot intercede for a sinner. Uh, today we can because we are interceding, not because we're sinners, we're interceding because we are in Christ. Christ has cleansed us with precious blood. The mediator must be innocent, like Jesus. So Adam himself was guilty. So the guilty one cannot intercede for another guilty one. It has to be a holy one who is without sin. Next question. Pastor, beside the fact that Jesus was God and was sinless, um, what could explain the fact that he grew so fast and I say overtook other creatures who do not fall. Every other creature whom he created thousands of years before the, his manifestation. Uh, because Jesus on earth, he joined with his uh, OS, as I say, uh, he, his, he, he became conscious of who he was before he came. So when he came, he cannot cease. Then as he grew, you can grow to the level where you can join back with the intelligence that you have before you came. And so Jesus got that because he was without sin. Right, let's see. Uh, do angels understand love the way we do since we get to see suffering and endure? Uh, no, they do not understand the same way. Do uh, it, it's just like asking, uh, uh, I'm sorry, angels, if I illustrate it that way, but they understand. If you ask an end, what is suffering? The end would not know. It's just different. And so angels are just totally different. They do not grow up with fathers and mothers. They're created perfect and fully grown. So they don't have the equal capacity it's like when you grow up from small, there is no limit to your growth. But when you get a certain size, then there is a limitation. Uh, next question. Do angels go to trials that test their love, especially in regards to our angels who will help us in some way? Angels have already completed all their testing and trial during the age of rebellion. So they don't have to go through that anymore. Uh, same like during the millennium, all those of us who have been in this age do not have to be tested like the people in the millennium. Uh, Pastor, how to repair a broken relationship if one has severely hurt, betrayed the other personally? 
uh, would say only God and time. And so, and that is only if the other person is willing. Okay. Well, praise God, we we'll cover all the Q&A and any final conclusions? Uh, Colin? Or Elijah? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, sorry about the calling, but yeah. There was a question over there um, where um, I think um, it will, they were asking that why didn't Adam pray for um, um, forgiveness for Eve? Yeah, um, yeah. Before Adam partook of the of the fruit itself, did he Possibly. have the knowledge? Yeah, but at that time, did he have the knowledge of forgiveness and all? Since he had not partaken. Okay, his limitation was experience. Although he had a super mind, not fallen, there is still the handicap of a lack of experience. Because knowledge of things need uh, sufficient experience and time. Okay. Because I, I was thinking that since he had not taken out the fruit yet, he wouldn't he have known have. the depth and the experience that you're saying to even know how to maybe intercede or pray to God to forgive her. It would have been Eve, um, Eve herself to pray to God for forgiveness if Adam had not taken of the uh, Fruit yeah. Well. yeah. Okay. There was a certain handicap. I don't know if we can English word for that. It's like naive innocence, ignorance, or something at that level where there was still a lack, even though he was created perfect. Like the lack of um, experiential wisdom. Mm. Because I was thinking in terms of um, kinsman redeemer as well, because Jesus had to come in a form um, of human in order to be our kinsman. Yes. So I uh, them at that time, yeah, we're like that, yeah. So mm. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. In fact, with, without, without sin, there is no need for Jesus to come in a way, or without. Um, imperfection to or, or, or a certain lack in the race of Adam then there is no need for a second Adam to come uh, it looks like for Adam when he and Eve when they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it is the first time they actually are open to understanding or saw or aware of evil. I think it must be quite a shock to their system also, right? Yes. Because especially they did not have um, the tree of life because life from God means there is a light, love um, and life, you know, and uh, yeah. without the love and the, char the character of God, it cannot balance off the knowledge of evil. Correct. So they did not know what to do also at the time, I think, after that. That's why they went and hit themselves, right? Yes. Uh, so we, just, Yeah, like we, if we land on a country uh, that is foreign, mm. everything is new. It's like, I think when he, he ate of it, his eyes suddenly are open and he saw some, uh, some things that are, all these are very strange. And um, I, I guess he had fear at that time. Yes. That's why he hid from God, yeah. He's so, I think it's very, very uh, scary. So, Pastor, what would your advice be um, um, practically for a couple to really work their way to that form of unity? Mm -hmm. Practically, because um, when it comes to knowledge base, it's easy, but when it comes to the practical side, it's, uh, it's something else. Mm. I would say the first place to start is always to pray together. Uh, it don't have to be a long prayer, one hour, two hour meeting, uh, but it's good that they pray together uh, every night before they sleep and that they have a common meditation that each can do 
and then they communicate with each other. I think it takes time for love to grow. It takes time for understanding to grow. And then don't get too bogged down when there are misunderstandings, but use the misunderstandings to grow deeper. Every time there's a quarrel or misunderstanding, use that as an opportunity to grow greater love. And if through the misunderstanding, love can grow deeper, uh, then that is true love. And then understanding each other grows better. And pray for each other. I mean, intercede for each other, uh, even in your own private life. That uh, then through walking with God, I find that when one chooses to walk close with God, God blesses the spouse and reverse on both sides. That without saying anything, God began to do downloads to the spouse, teach the staff and speak to the staff. Like is, Jesus is always present in every relationship. And he whispers knowledge, imparts knowledge to each other to create understanding. Hmm. There's a question here. Paul prayed for wisdom before love is prayer, or wish to, wish powerful, according to 1 Corinthians 13. I thought love is the greatest. And actually, Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, was just one of his prayers. He has prayed for love, or Philippians, in Philippians 1. Perhaps he knew what to pray for, not because he was praying wisdom before uh, love. He just knew what the church need at that time and pray. And of course, the spirit, wisdom, and revelation is the six of the seven spirits. And he would have established them in truth and love before that. Well, praise God. This is good. I hope uh, each one of you continue to ponder on the depth of your relationship with one another. And uh, next week, we'll look at uh, minister relationship like Jesus and his uh, apostles or the people who work together in the Bible where we can learn lessons from them too. And let's give God praise and worship. Father, we thank you for all your grace and your mercy. We ask that you open our eyes to see. Open our eyes to see. To see through your eyes to see through one another's eyes, to see, Father, things beyond our own little circle, that we can see, truly see, what it is beyond us. So we ask that you open our heart and open our mind, that we can see with the eyes of Jesus, see with the eyes of the Spirit, that we can understand the way you can understand. I have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, and the affection of Christ working in each one. And in that way, Father, you help us to walk the walk in which you want us to do. Thank you that we all progress towards you in Christ likeness in our own way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's been a good Sunday. And uh, good evening to those of you who are evening. And I'm reaching towards the evening, morning to those of you morning or afternoon uh, or early morning. God bless you. Praise God. Amen. God bless you too, Pastor. Thank you. Pastor. Thank you. Bless you. Bye bye. God bless. God bless. Bye bye. God bless. Bye. Blessings to everyone. Bye.